Hey guys, I'm Cadroth, and today I'm going to be talking to you about Miss Crane. Miss Crane is going to be our limited SSR caster uh, servant that's going to be coming out with the Grail Live event here soon. Now, I've heard a lot of people talk about Miss Crane over the years as to, you know, should you roll for her? Is she considered a meta support or anything like that? The one thing that's not up for debate is the fact that she is a support. She's absolutely geared towards helping your party out and basically facilitating you in numerous ways. However, she's not really going to be the most meta of supports, and I'm gonna explain why here. So to me, just to give you a quick TLDR, I would advise only rolling for her if you really either want to A, have fun, or B, you sense that you have enough to acquire her now and still go after all of your targets that are upcoming this year. This is going to be a very packed year in terms of uh, people wanting to roll for very high octane, high desirable units to make sure you don't screw yourself out of those opportunities and get baited into rolling if you don't want to. You do not have to have Miss Crane by any stretch of the imagination, but she can help you out in numerous ways and I'm gonna show you how here. So let's go ahead and start by talking about her kit. Right off the bat, the number one thing I'm going to point out to you guys is the fact that she has less than 10K attack. This is one of the lowest attack stats amongst all five stars. This is exceedingly low. There are numerous other four stars that have higher attack stats than this, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. Now, that being said, she ends up getting the reverse side of things, having almost 15K HP. That definitely helps her be tanky. And in that regard, this is good because you're not gonna want Miss Crane to die prematurely nor are you really going to need Miss Crane to do that much damage for you. So I actually do like this stat allocation. Don't sit here and think that just because she has low attack, that makes her bad. Remember, she is a support character for you. Now, looking at her kit here, again, she is Earth attributed. She has 49 star absorption. Again, this is pretty typical for casters. 10.8 star gin as well but she only has 0.39 NP charge attack rate. Now, this would be considered low, but keep in mind, she is a support caster. who's are gonna have a lot of tools to work with in that regard. She does have 3% NP charge on defense, so whenever she gets hit by the enemies. Again, that is basically average, so nothing really to write home about. She has a fairly high death rate though, at 46.5%. But there's a reason why for this, so, you may be concerned about this, but don't worry about it too much, and I'll show you guys here in a minute. She is neutral good, she is female, and her basic traits here are that she's an animal characteristic servant, again, because she's Miss Crane. She is a fairy tale servant, humanoid, a normal servant, and weak to Enema Elish. Now, a big chunk about why her NP gain stat is so low is because she has not only triple arts, but a four hit arts card on top of that. So this is a lot of potential arts generation capability in one deck. Not only will her arts cards have multiple hits by which to generate the NP for each individual use, but it will be exceedingly easy for you to form triple arts chains with her having that triple arts deck. So as a result, you're gonna get the benefit of having you know an additional 20% charge there to help you out if you can manage to form those chains. So that is one of the reasons why her NP gain stat is kept low, but it's not the whole reason, and we'll talk about that even more in a second. Now, looking at her other two cards here, she has a single buster card with only two hits, which is below average, but thankfully we don't care too much about these particular issues when it comes to a buster card. And then with her quick card here, she is a three hit quick, which is average. So again, basically you have four decent options for generating a phantasm thanks to that quick card. So really nice. And then her extra attack is coming in right at average at five hit. And maybe hope that that would maybe have been a little bit extra since she had the lower NP gain rate, but it's not the end of the world. Now, as we look into her kit here, you can see her first skill will grant the party invincibility except herself for one turn. So she doesn't get that hard survival aspect to her own kit. It's going to increase the party's critical star generation rate, except for herself, for three turns by up to 100% here. This is really nice. 
uh, Caskill basically ends up having a very similar type of skill in his repertoire. Now, again, she will gain crit stars based off the number of costume owning allies except herself. And this is gonna be one of her important gimmicks here. She basically, with this, gets a star bomb that generates stars for each costume owning ally in the party. So it's up to 10. So she doesn't have the costume owning trait. So as a result, she can't qualify. But even if she were to at some point later, they precluded this by saying, except self. So even in one day, if she was supposed to get a costume at some point, it wouldn't allow her to work with her own skill here. But basically anybody else currently in the front line there can get it for her. And you guys can see here, this is a list of all your costume owning servants in the game. There are quite a few. And this list is ever expanding as we get more costumes over time. Naturally, this is an issue. We would like for more units in the game to have costumes, but we are beholden to the devs to that extent. And this almost maybe gives the devs a reason not to give us more, which is a sad thing. But still, I do really like this aspect. It does play really nicely in on this. And it's one of the things that I think they did well with her because it's a nice limitation to how her kit works. Now, again, like I said, so if you have up to two other allies in the party that are one of the costume owning variety, you can get up to 20 stars then. And that's a really nice number for her and you'll see why in a second. But as we go to her second skill here, you guys can see she gets a 100% charge skill on her NP which is really, really good to have. Again, this is why fundamentally she doesn't need that high of an NP gain rate because she already has triple arts because her arts cards already have good hit counts. And because she has a 100% charge skill, you're never really going to need to charge her too much. And even if you do, odds are you've probably got some other support there in the party than at that point to try and help facilitate that. And again, Based along those lines, there is already at least Merlin that does have a costume out there for himself. Plus, you'll probably end up seeing units like Clay and Skya get this later, but don't worry about that. Again, this is one of those things where you guys should just pay attention to the fact that there will be some key characters that could be standing opposite her that could have, again, costume owning traits. And actually, Clay and Skya does have a costume. I totally already forgot about that. Um, but still, really, really nice in that regard. So it will deal 2000 damage to herself. That is one of the demerits, but remember she has relatively thick HP. So we're not super concerned about her just getting one tapped by a boss, unless that boss can just one tap anyone, or maybe they're just a rider. In that case, be very careful. But she also will draw attention of all enemies to the party except herself for three turns. So this is where that first skill, not granting herself invincibility can be really nice. She can't give herself invincibility, but because of that, she can't give herself the taunt either. So all the attacks, if you activate this skill, will still be headed elsewhere. The only exceptions to this would be AOE attacks of the Noble Phantasm or even down the line, potentially carding variety. So if these were to happen, then yes, you would have to watch out for her, but obviously that may not be the best of turns, bring her out on or to use her on you may just need to adjust your strategy accordingly if that were to happen then as we get to the third skill here you guys can see it's a thousand years gratitude a and it increases one ally's critical star absorption for three turns by up to 500 percent really really nice in that regard so that's going to allow you to soak the stars that you have generated on that ally which can again be miss crane if you needed it to be it's going to increase their critical damage for three turns Again, up to 50%, which is really solid. And then it's also going to grant them instant kill immunity for three turns. Now, keep in mind that she doesn't have a great death rate here. This is actually a really high death rate, something that enemies would easily be able to prey upon. But she could target herself with this third skill to make herself instant kill immune. But you don't have to. In fact, one of the best uses of Miss Crane is going to be popping all of her skills and getting her out of the party. So I think you guys can basically expect that that's going to happen again with regards to someone like, say, 
uh, you know, one of her allies there having the taunt on them, maybe you're in a death sort of gimmick fight. And so because of that, they're gonna have invincibility, they're going to have the taunt on them, and then now at least one of your choices will be instant kill immune for three turns as well. That can be really nice. Now, as we get to her passive skills, you can see that she does get her own unique territory creation variant here. It's going to increase Art's performance by an additional 7% on top of already the good uh, hit counts that she had. It's gonna increase her critical star generation rate by 30% which is going to help that out even more. It means that as far as casters go, this crane will actually be pretty decent at generating stars compared to what most, you know, casters normally aren't that good at. And then on top of this, she gets an item construction for clothes, which is her own unique variant that increases the party's buff success rate by 10% while she is on the field. And this includes sub members, which is really nice in that regard. It means you can definitely gain the benefit of having an increased chance of buff success. And so she might be able to offset someone's chance for failure, like with Imperial Privilege or just another chance-based skill. So this is definitely a really nice sort of hidden gem of Miss Crane's kit. It's not a full 20%, it's not 40% or anything like that, but hey, if it helps you land the skill, you're not gonna care. So that extra 10% can definitely help you out in that regard. Now talking about her pen skills, we already said that she has really low uh, attack stats. So I'm gonna say again, you probably don't want to really focus on her extra attack finesse. To me, this is gonna be one of the lower tier ones for you in that regard. Her second skill here, mana loading though, could prove useful if you think that you're going to have the need to slingshot her. And so if you're unfamiliar with the concept of slingshotting, it basically involves buffing up a damage dealing unit. So we're gonna call them D1. Basically, you end up having supports in the party with you. And so what you end up doing is you end up buffing up the damage dealing unit with both the supports buffs, and then you basically rotate them to the back of your party. Well, in that time, you let the cooldowns expire and you either wait for your order change to come back or you get the unit that replaced them killed. And then that brings them back out into the front in order to get buffed again once all the buff cooldowns are inactive. And so the time they spent on the back line, that first set of buffs that they had didn't expire. And so as a result of that, they end up with four different sets of buffs, basically two from the first application and two from the second application really really nice and really a strong way to amp a lot of damage on one particular unit now this is in, an interesting concept because with miss crane you guys are going to see from her np her major gimmick is being able to change the party around so you may find a time where you need to get miss crane to rotate through multiple times depending on what your gimmick is depending on Maybe you're in some sort of stall comp like the King Protea fight or something like that. And maybe you're just using her to shuffle things around. Well, if that's the case, then you might want to be able to get her to her Noble Phantasm more naturally. And so as a result of that, something like mana loading might be okay. But even still, I'm going to say that's a pretty weak case for her. And so mana loading is not super important on Miss Crane in that regard. As we look to her third skill here, it's anti-ruler attack damage aptitude. We already know Miss Crane is a support. She does not have a damage dealing NP, nor is her attack stat very strong. So yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and say it. Miss Crane is one of those rare units where a pin skills really don't matter. They don't make a big difference for her either way. So again, unless they change something with the pin system and add an additional append later on, I think you guys are pretty safe to go ahead and ignore your coins for Miss Crane or focus them more on something like Grailing if you so choose. Now, as we look to her Noble Phantasm here, again, this is where Miss Crane actually gets interesting. So again, it's an EX rank, which means it is unique in and of itself, and it is a support style of NP. Again, you can see it's art, so that will help you out with forming arch chains if you so choose but you can only use her NP when there's 20 critical stars or more available. This is a really interesting limitation, and we actually just got done talking about this in another video, but the evolution of star consumption skills. 
Well, Miss Crane doesn't have a skill, but she does have an NP that takes this. But if you remember, 20 stars is the magic number that you can get from her first skill. Again, you can get up to 10 for each costume owning servant in the party at the moment. So it doesn't include herself, but that means you can have up to two other people. If they both have costumes on, you're gonna get 10 per each of them, AKA 20. So as a result, if you're using two other costume using servants, you can basically at that point, the same turn as triggering her first skill, fire off her NP. Now, there are other ways you can get stars into the party, including obviously just star generation from cards, stars per turn gimmicks and skills, uh, again, craft essences. So maybe Miss Crane comes into the party through another unit dying, or maybe her getting plug suited in. If that's the case, Miss Crane herself can have a star bomb CE on her if you so choose. So that would allow the stars to come in right there from that. Or again, you could use the mystic code if you so chose. But there are numerous other ways basically to get stars. And that's what makes this not that big of a deal. You just have to set up for it and plan accordingly. And trust me when I say this, you're gonna want to if you're using Miss Crane. Because as we look at her NP, let's talk about the limitations of it in spite of how strong it is. So it's going to increase the first ally's attack except herself for three turns. So this is the leftmost ally in the party that is not Miss Crane. Think of it like a Ching Gong mechanic where he sacrifices the leftmost unit in the party that is not himself. Similar sort of deal here. So she's gonna increase their attack for three turns. Again, this is what actually scales with her NP level. It gets up to 40% at NP5, but it is a base of 20% attack up for those three turns at NP1. Again, it's gonna increase their NP damage by 30% for three turns. This is a really interesting thing to pay attention to because again, it's the leftmost unit. It's gonna increase their NP damage by 30% for three turns. And that itself can be boosted by Oberon even further. So again, remember any amount of NP damage that you can add to a unit can be doubled by Oberon. So that is another interesting sort of synergy that she's gonna have with one of the other supports out there. Then it will move Miss Crane to the last reserve slot. So just so that you guys are aware, again, you have your three frontline party spots. Okay, and then you have your back line, AKA the reserve spots. So the relationship works as follows. Miss Crane will basically end up rotating herself to the last remaining slot. However, everybody else moves forward a slot in order to make room. Similarly, Miss Crane will end up buffing the leftmost ally. So it's a really interesting and intriguing way that she rotates the party. And you're going to have to think about that. That is a really odd thing that she does. OK, but just as long as you plan accordingly, you'll be OK. But it's an important thing to understand. Now, again, there's a couple notes here that you guys should understand here. Number one is that after moving, the servant who comes out is the leftmost one in the sub slot. So again, like I basically said, of your three backline slots, even though Miss Crane will move into the last slot there, the one that comes out is this first one. Again, really important to understand that. And then I, I was talking about this actually before we started to record. This is not that big of a deal, but basically uh, the note here is that unlike order change, the position change will reset your deck so that it becomes the first turn of a new command card cycle. And if you want to think about this logically, it makes perfect sense as to why. The reason why is if you start thinking about other units, like say with order change, or again, uh, card shuffles or anything like that, they happen on your turn during the skill selection phase. And so that's why the cards are already distributed. That's why it doesn't break the chain in most of those cases. Again, it basically with order change, actually I said card shuffle, card shuffle does break the chain. Um, but in the case of command cards, this is why, again, uh, when you use order change, it doesn't normally break it, okay? Because you're not dealing a new hand. You're just replacing one unit with another unit. 
And so if you had, say, the fourth card available for the unit that was getting rotated out, the unit that comes in will give you their fourth card normally. So they just replace one for the other. It might change what the card is. Like for instance, in Miss Crane's case, her fourth card would be arts. For another unit, it might be Buster. So it just really depends on which of those cards was available and you might not know. So that is a little bit of an issue to card shuffling that I think a lot of people don't really think about. But the reason this makes so much sense is because like I said, order change normally happens on your turn during the skill selection phase. It definitely though resets the party whenever there's a death and we've, or sorry, resets the, the cards whenever there's a death. And we've known this with Chen Gong and with Arash. They both do that. Same thing here. Because it's happening from a noble phantasm, because you've already selected your cards, it is now a new hand of cards that's coming out. So naturally, anyways, you were gonna get a new hand, but the important thing to understand is it becomes the first turn of a new command card cycle. If you guys are unaware, command cards operate in a three turn cadence normally. This can be changed depending on how many units are actually available. For instance, if there's only two units on the field, it's a two turn cycle. And if there's only one unit on the field, it's a one turn cycle. But otherwise, as long as you have enough units, it's normally a three turn cycle of your command cards. And it will rotate through all those cards pending certain things happening you shuffling the cards manually, someone dying, or again, something like Miss Crane's NP. Order change itself doesn't normally do this. Miss Crane's variant does. So it's important to understand that, that you can use it to your advantage if you plan on counting cards. Now, her overcharge effect is that it will charge the first allies in P gauge, except herself, by 30%. So, in summary, Miss Crane has the ability to protect the party, the ability to generate stars and increase star generate, the ability to charge herself to full from zero, as well as to taunt the rest of the party, and the ability to give an ally critical star absorption, increase crit damage, and instant kill immunity while it will, again, deal 1,000 damage without killing to herself, okay? So she does a lot of sort of extra stuff for the party there. But then her Noble Phantasm increases the attack and NP damage and it charges them. So that leftmost unit is getting a lot of love for Miss Crane. And that's the important use for Miss Crane. She will buff the crap out of one of your units. And then she will get the heck out. That's why it's so nice to use her. Because of this aspect, Miss Crane rotates out of the back of the party, brings someone in, and you didn't have to use a plug suit to do it. But you can. You can use her in conjunction with a plug suit. You can basically have Miss Crane start out in the party, rotate herself out with her NP, and then come back in with plug suit. So as a result, if you wanna send a unit to the back and bring them forward without killing them, you don't have to wait on two plug suit cooldowns. You only have to wait on one. And that's an interesting aspect to this. Miss Crane allows you to shuffle the party without killing or sacrificing someone. And that's really worth. That is intriguing. But I said there was a limitation, and it's one that's not really covered here. You can only move if there are two other party members left in the field. There's another aspect of this that's not really mentioned by fandom. There also has to be a unit on the back line. You see, Miss Crane can't move out of the party if there's nobody to replace her with. She will go nowhere. So that is another interesting little annoyance there. But that's not even the one I'm talking about. The one I'm talking about is 
if you want to shuffle the party with Miss Crane, you've got to learn to get very, very smart about your order. The limitation here is that Miss Crane becomes exceedingly difficult to use if you're going to try and farm with her. In fact, most of these scenarios in which Miss Crane will find a lot of use for you are going to be in challenge content where there's a break bar where you can shuffle her after somebody has actually used their NP. That's going to be the smart thing for how you handle her. That's going to be what allows you to basically get around this. You're going to fire off someone's NP and then shuffle the party. And that's going to get you again more buffs. It's going to get you charge. It's going to get you more people in there. And the reason that's important is because remember, you want that 30% charge for your leftmost unit. Well, if they're your nuke, if they're the person that's going to be handling most of the waves for you, you kind of need them at full charge already in order to fire off their NP. If you want to be able to take advantage of this, you're going to need to use her NP after someone else's. Now, there are other instances where you could get away with this. That would be multi DPS setups. You could, for instance, use if if let's say our setup here was a damage dealer and a second damage dealer and then miss crane you could fire off damage dealer number two's in p but you could instead preempt that by firing off miss crane's in p she would confer all the buffs to damage dealer number one maybe that ends up charging him to 100 percent and then she gets out and brings somebody else in maybe another support so you can use her in farming some. It's just rare. And it's honestly probably not better than using another support. But if you really needed to charge in that regard, you could get away with it. It just, it does require somebody to already basically have full charge in order for that to work. So it's really, really rough in that regard. But yeah, it is an interesting thing. And you could abuse this for more overcharge if you really want it. So... Miss Crane's a very intricate and interesting unit. She's a very nuanced and niche unit, but she's a very strong unit if you use her correctly. You don't have to have her. She's not required. She'll absolutely help you if you need that extra party shift. And sometimes it makes all the difference. It really just depends on what you're trying to do. In that regard, Miss Crane can be especially useful if you're someone that's operating with, again, NP1s, and you're not necessarily trying to, to make the strongest possible unit. You're just trying to get them buffed as much as they can to be able to handle the, the challenge content. In that regard, she's worthy of your consideration. Don't overlook her. You will get another rerun, but again, let me know what you guys think. Are you guys gonna be rolling for her here? What do you like or dislike about Miss Crane's kit? And if you could change anything, what would you change? I'll see you guys for the next one.